coarse. It's really difficult to get sort of higher resolution information. So what I'm going to talk today is about some of the um, ways that the SDMI has gone about improving those data sets for the state, what data sets are available, and what the plan forward is to continue getting such sets. So for elevation, we've gone from 60 meter resolution, the two ARC second national elevation data set, to trying to get this five meter resolution IFSAR data that's um, a radar-based uh, airborne sensor that collects elevation information across the state at five meter resolution. The product from this is a terrain model uh, that's bare earth, a surface model, or I'm sorry, other way around, and then the um, orthorectified radar images, which is an optical interpretation of how the radar is seeing the ground. So here's an example of what the difference is in the resolution of those two data sets. On the right-hand side, you'll see what was previously available, that 60-meter, um, two-arc second national elevation data set, and now the current five-meter resolution data that we're getting for the state. And some of the differences in what we're able to see and delineate as far as coastlines and the different landforms. And this is what we've got to date. This is slightly out of date, this coverage map. So all of the green and the tan cells we currently have now, and we're in contract to get the entire northeast corner that you see there in yellow as not flown. So that will be flown this summer. We're hoping to have the, the um, data, including the northeast corner, available this, um, by the following year in 2017. So the data that's available in blue is available on the uh, our DGGS website, and I will I'll have a link to that later on in the presentation on how you can access that data and download it and view it. But first I'd like to talk about the imagery also because we've gone from having 15 meter Landsat imagery data as being the best available data to we contracted for this two and a half meter spot data. And there's some license restrictions on the spot data. When, this, when the SDMI contract went into play in 2010, the best available data we could get was this two and a half meter, but it was flown by the spot satellite that's owned by the Astrium Corporation, uh, a subsidiary of the European Defense Union. So there was a lot of restrictions on the license. So it's licensed for everyone to use for non-commercial use. There is a buy-up option if you're a commercial entity and want, want to be able to use the data. The web mapping services are free for everybody to use. So if you just need to visualize the data, you just need an image, a backdrop in your map, that's available as a web mapping service that you can pull into your GIS project. But if you want the data to run in a model, if you want the infrared data specifically or some or the um, the other bands that are available, you would need to buy a commercial the commercial buy up option if you're a commercial vendor, not university and not government. University, government, nonprofits all have access to this data. So the products we got were a statewide ortho mosaic. These are orthorectified images with color infrared, pseudo natural color because the SPOT5 satellite does not fly a blue band. The near infrared is dropped down into the blue range to provide a pseudo natural color product, and the grayscale. The infrared sensor shoots at a 20 meter resolution, so that's pan sharpened with the grayscale. The grayscale sensor is a 2.5 meter, and the color, the red and the green bands, are shot at 10 meter resolution, but they're pan sharpened to that. Um, two and a half meter grayscale. So these are the bands that are available and sort of some, some of the uses I'm sure most of you are familiar with that you can use those bands for. Infrareds used quite a bit in the landscape analysis models for vegetation and water soil analysis. So far we were unable to get, it's an optical sensor, the satellite sensors, and over the Aleutians, through the course of the six years of the project, they, we weren't able to get cloud-free imagery over those red areas that are shown in the graphic on the screen. We do have coverage for 99% of the state. That's shown there in the light tan color. But the red part, the USGS is currently in contract to try to acquire that data this year. They've got some newer satellite constellations that are able to do coverages more frequently and some better options for coverage over that data set. So we'll probably have imagery over the Aleutians coming up in, the, in 2017. In the meantime, all of the area you see in the TAN is available, and that's being hosted from the Geographic Information Network of Alaska at the University of Alaska Fairbanks as web mapping services. And if you need to download tiles as well, you can get those tiles, and I'll have a link for that at the end of the presentation too. 
So the funding for this imagery project was paid for 50% by the Coastal Impact Assistance Program. So I just wanted to do a shout out to them as well for the, the funding and making this um, project so successful. So what it is is a program that mitigates impacts from the offshore oil and gas development. And there are six states that were eligible for this, these dollars. So part of it was to go to improve this digital base map for Alaska. And I'm going to, I just threw in some of these slides just for information. You can look at them closer later on, but I'll, for time's sake, move through these fairly quickly. So basically, it's to benefit the natural coastal environment, and which our digital maps did because you're able to see so much more clearly the digital coast. So one of the projects that was also done at the same time as ours was the Shore Zone Project, which some of you might know about, but I also wanted to talk about because it's also another valuable source of imagery for the coastline areas. And it was flown with a helicopter with a geologist and a biologist on board giving narrative and commentary as the helicopter flew along as to what they were seeing in that flight. And the video is geo-referenced to the ground as well. So you can go to the Shore Zone um, program webpage there and be able to click on the map and get the associated link of the video that's being flown as well and listen to that narrative from the biologist and the geologist talking about the ground as they're flying along. So this year, with the, um, there, the CAP pro project closes out in December of this year, 2016. So there's some end-of-year funds that were rolled back into the imagery program to update some areas where there was some older imagery, or in some cases, some cloud cover or some um, really severe cut lines. When the satellite images are sewn together into the tiles, sometimes a, an image might be taken at a different point in the year. So one might be taken in spring, one might be taken in fall. And when those scenes are cut together, there's a really strong cut line in the resulting tile. So we highlighted some of those areas where there were some, um, some of the radiometric issues with the tiles that needed some, up, up, um, some refresh. And then we also highlighted the areas where there was older data used. So 2010 data, that's now five years old. And our ideal goal for this is to have imagery that's available that's always current within five years. So we highlighted those areas for refresh, and the areas that you're seeing on the screen with the yellow outlines are going to be updated this year with 1.5 meter resolution imagery. In addition to this, the Glacier Bay National Park is going to be uplifted as well. The National Park Service has imagery for that area, and we're going to um, pay to uplift that license so that it's available at the same level than all non-commercial users that the rest of the SDMI data is. These two data sets are being used by the USGS for topographic map production. They're updating all the 1 to 25,000 scale topographic maps for Alaska. So this is sort of a map of what their planned projection is for what's happened so far. The green has been completed, 17, 000, or 1,756 maps, and what's planned to be completed for this year, another 1,900 maps. Casey Krieger has been leading the AK Hydro project, which is chartered underneath the ACER um, committee. So they are working on updating hydrographic lines, line work for shoreline, inland waters, as well as offshore waters for the state. So they're trying to update all of these at least to a 1 to 25,000 scale, in some cases much, much finer resolution. And they've gone from densification of one mile per square mile, one mile of river per square mile of area to two and three miles of rivers that just didn't, weren't on the map because the maps were never at that high of a resolution before. So they've made a lot of progress. They still have a lot to go. So, right, so they are working to um, update the hydrography in the state as well. And they're working with USGS in conjunction with the topographic maps so that those hydrographic edits can make it to the maps as well. And I put to here a list of different data sources that users within the Department of Natural Resources use for GIS data as well. So these don't necessarily pertain to the statewide data sets that I'm working on currently, but it might be of use to you as well. There's some land fire resources here, the BLM fire sites, the SDMS data set from the BLM has a lot of web mapping service feeds available from the BLM data as far as land ownership and different sorts of vegetation and um, land classifications. And also there's that the D Division of Geophysical Surveys site about fourth up from the bottom. 
that's where you can access all of that five meter resolution elevation data set that's being flown by the aircraft with the, with the radar sensors. So all of that information, the digital terrain models as well as the digital surface models and the orthorectified images can be searched for graphically through a map there. You can um, highlight your area of interest and download those tiles from that website. And then um, there's the state of Alaska has an ArcGIS Online website, so I included that link too so you can take a look at our website. And the connection parameters for being, oh, so if you do need to add in certain data layers, I, this is more, the last, second to last line from the end is more to people that are, have access within the state network. But I can set it up so that you have access to our data sets via an SDE connection if you're using ArcGIS desktop. So if you're interested in that, feel free to email me. That's um, something that we can set up as well for access to the state data set. And then the statewide imagery and the web mapping services are hosted at the alaskamaps.org website, and that's run by the Geographic Information Network of Alaska at University of Alaska Fairbanks. And those guys are really good. They've got all these web mapping services up for the SDMI imagery. They also run a layer called the BDL, which stands for Best Data Layer. And the BDL is different from SDMI, and it includes more than just the SDMI. It has the SDMI plus other data sets that are publicly available, like NRCS, soil conservation data, um, they fly imagery, so all of those imagery data sets are in there. Kodiak Borough Island, Island um, Borough has imagery, and so that's included in there. So any data set that they are, have available that people have um, public license to, we ask that you send those in to the University of Alaska Fairbanks to include in this BDL layer. And that just sort of is a one-stop shop so that you can see what is the best imagery available for my project. And if you, they also run a program, too, to coordinate between groups that are acquiring imagery. So if, there, you don't, if you look on that site, you find that you don't have imagery in your area, you're going to need to contract out for that. They have templates for the contracts. They have templates and recommended um, language for the end user license agreement to make sure that everybody has access to that data once it's acquired. Or if it's going to be an additional cost, like the um, cost was for the SDMI data to uplift it to a commercial level license, what that cost is and outlining what the steps are and how people could go about uplifting that license too. So if you are going to be acquiring imagery for a project, definitely coordinate with University of Alaska Fairbanks GINA team. Their, their email, I don't think I included, no I did not unfortunately. Their email is on the website on alaskamap.org or it's, you can email them at support at GINA G-I-N-A dot Alaska dot gov. And one way where we talk about how to coordinate these efforts and make sure that we're not um, duplicating efforts or if somebody has some funds for a project but not enough to cover their entire project area, one place where we talk about that for the state is the Alaska Geospatial Technical Working Group. So if you are interested in being involved in these sorts of statewide mapping discussions, I've, um, it's open to anybody that our next meeting is going to be February 4th at 10 a.m. And if you want to participate, just shoot me an email and I'd be happy to add you to that group. Here's some of our coordination websites that that group uses, the alaskamap.org site, of course. And then I've got a site at, that I inherited here at um, DNR at, called the AGC, which stands for the Alaska Geospatial Council. And it's currently under revision. So if you go there and you see some outdated stuff, um, forgive me. And suggestions are definitely welcome on that. And then also our partners at USGS with the national map.gov. So a little bit more on the AGC, that stands for Alaska Geospatial Council. And since the SDMI was really run by that 2006 $6 million appropriation, when those funds were all spent, there was no more need to have an SDMI executive committee. But we saw a lot of value in having that group and coordinating these statewide framework data sets like imagery and elevation. So we continued the group. We have it chartered through the governor as the Alaska Geospatial Council. And the six state agencies and the university that were originally part of the SDMI are on that group. And we're annexing in additional partners. So we've annexed in partners at the federal. And we're hoping to get somebody from the local level. We also have a representative from the Alaska Native Corporations as well through the ANSCA Board of CEOs. So we're trying to broaden and sort of increase our reach so that all of the stakeholders that have interest in having good, up-to-date, statewide digital maps are represented on that group. 
If you'd like to learn more, again, just email me, and I'm happy to discuss more if you have questions at the end of my presentation, too. So a couple other things that happened. In 2011, we came up with the Alaska Geospatial Plan. This was contracted through a CAP-3 grant that the National States Geographic Information Council helps coordinate. I think I misspoke on that. But there was a, a grant that we got to help pay for this to have a third party put together business and strategic plans for Alaska about what our plan is for mapping the state. So this is, these two plans are really what are driving our statewide framework mapping. And the framework data sets include elevation, imagery, transportation, administrative boundaries, um, our cadastral parcel fabrics, geodetic control, and forgot one, hydrography. So those are the seven that we're focused on trying to improve, and those are the seven that are addressed in the geospatial business plan as far as how we're going to get to these in the next five years. So I'd really love to coordinate with the IRPIC a little bit more and see if any of those goals and those plans are in alignment and how we can work together on those things. So again, here's my contact information. I'm Ann Johnson, ann.johnson at alaska.gov. And there's um, email is probably the best way to reach me. And I'm here in Anchorage based on in uh, the Department of Natural Resources working on these framework data sets. So I think that's everything that I have to cover. Do, is, there's just a couple minutes left of my, my allocated 20 minutes, I think. Does anybody have any questions or want me to cover anything in more detail? Hey, I have a couple of questions, this is George Christopher. Uh The first one is regarding the spatial accuracy uh, of the spot imagery. Uh, is it less than two and a half meters? Yes, we're coming within two, one to two pixels of, re, of uh, accuracy, so that's two and a half meters to five. The specification okay. for the contract was 12.2 meter accuracy, and we're well below that. So the, the second question is, is regarding the radiometric correction, because you are pan sharpening both images. Uh, are you thinking to first uh, correct radiometrically the hyperspectral, uh, the multispectral, before merging to the high resolution imagery? That I am not sure on. I would have to ask. Fugro Spatial is who did our radiometric accurate our radiometric um, correction. And I want to say that they corrected before they merged they pan sharpened, but I don't know that for, for sure. I'll i I'll find out. And if you can shoot me an email, I would be happy to find out and put you in contact with the person with the answer to that. Okay, thanks. Sure. Hi, this is Liz Hoy at NASA. I wondered if you'd heard about the Arctic DEM that the Polar Geospatial Center is putting together. It's going to be Alaska and uh, all circumpolar uh, between like a two and eight meter um, resolution. Yes, so absolutely. We are with the Polar Geospatial Center, and they okay. have an optical DEM, so that's going to be a surface DEM, one of the uh, DSM. And uh -huh. we are really excited about that product. We've got a pre-sample of it that we're running some comparisons. We don't have our, our results yet about what the comparisons are with the IFSAR data, but we definitely need an interim product because IFSAR is expensive and slow to fly. So we're really ex excited also about being able to use the PGC data for change detection too. The IFSAR is likely going to be a one-time baseline data set. Okay, great, thanks. I, if this is Sarah, if I could also add that um, there's going to be an IRPIC wide webinar, which we're going to, uh, we do now have a, a date that's set for that, which is um, uh, Paul Morin is going to be speaking, two people from NGA, and Tracy Fuller from USGS on GON. And um, that is on February 24th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And there'll be an announcement going out about that. Um, and, and maybe we can coordinate with you if you also want to be able to be on that panel. Um, we can we can coordinate with you. So I'll follow up with you on that. Sounds good. Thanks. So and I forgot to mention one thing. Uh, here at the university, we bought two years ago through an NSF project a hyperspectral instrument, and we have been flying to Yukon Flats and Fairbanks area, and Gary Pocket Creek. And we have really nice results. So if you're interested in, I can send you a PDF we presented to the poster we presented to AGU last year. Sure. Thank you. 
And this is Kathy Wilson. Um, I have a question about the hydrographic um, mapping updates um, in the Seward Peninsula. Um, I, I don't know if you can slide back to that slide, um, but I, I was just wondering, um, the gray areas, are those uh, uh, already well taken care of or and, and and so they've already been updated or are they just considered not, um, they're not as important for updates? Can you describe this map and the efforts that are going on in the Seward in particular? Sure, so what this is, the AK Hydro project began as a Southeast project and was really modeled through updating the Southeast hydrography for many, many years and just this year was expanded statewide. So they did have some funding to do the Matsu Basin and they really focused their efforts on that to show that they could become statewide and then also in the NRP, NPRA area as well. And so it's just, there. the gray areas have not been updated yet although um, they do have support to, to update the areas that are dark gray, and they don't have support yet for the areas that are light gray, but they're, that's, we're getting more and more support all the time, and this map is probably slightly out of date already. So there, it's just a, a, fact, a factor of becoming a statewide project and sort of expanding as funding becomes available. But we have partnerships with the LLCs that support all of those areas, including the Seward, that are in the dark gray. So updates for those areas should be forthcoming in the next year or two. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, thank you very much, you guys. I really appreciate the opportunity to present. Again, if you have any questions at all, feel free to email me, and thanks again. Great, thanks, Ann. Um, really appreciate that update, and uh, and especially with regard to some of the um, strategic goals you mentioned toward the end of your talk. Um, this collaboration team within IARPIC is a good place to to keep um, coming back for communication and and um, cross pollination for that stuff. 